Carter with the Delaware Key Squared Center. We are the uh, smallest geographically uh, of the centers in the region, but I like to think that uh, uh, by weight, we're the largest. So, uh, and I, I, I carry the ball there. So um, anyway, we're really happy to have Jason Dietz with us uh, this morning for this session. Uh, and uh, Jason uh, is, is really great on this topic. Uh, the topic, of course, being fundamentals of pavement preservation. So it's sort of a high-level look at pavement preservation, and he's going to do a great job with it. Jason uh, has worked for the Federal Highway Administration for 24 years in various field engineering positions and now works with the Pavement and Materials Technical Services team at the Resource Center. Prior to joining Federal Highway, he worked for five years as a consultant on various construction projects, he obtained his Bachelor of Science and Master's of Science degrees in civil engineering from the University of Nevada. Uh, in his free time, Jason coaches his son's baseball team and enjoys hiking with his family. And so now we know almost everything we need to know about Jason. And so I'll hand it over to him. Jason, thanks so much for uh, doing this this morning. Thank you, Matthew. And good morning, everyone. As I wake up this morning in sunny Colorado, we have uh, six to eight inches of snow outside my house and my my kids have a snow day, so they're happy. So, well, I like to welcome everybody. I'm going to turn my video off to help with the band. And um, just want to talk a little bit about today about the fundamentals of pavement preservation. All right, the key topics for our discussion today is what does preservation mean? Pavement condition versus pavement selection. How do you define quality? and some resources that you can take away from today's uh, discussion. With that said, the first polling question, what does preservation mean to your agency? Select all that apply. As a little ground, ground control, we like to have a little polling question to get started because definitions are important. And as you all know, um, we struggle with definitions of what preservation is, and we always like to start off with by saying this and mentioning this. Okay. This question one, um, we'll get to question two a little bit later, but if you want to answer both, that's fine. Great. Thanks, everyone, for participating. So it looks like we still got uh, some coming in here. Uh, we're at half a voted, so... <clears throat> That's great, nice to see extending life because that's, that's the key, as well as enhance performance and safety, ensure cost effectiveness, reduce user delays and preserve an investment. They all apply and I'm, I appreciate everybody uh, participating in this poll. So let's go, to, let's go back uh, to what the definition of pavement preservation is. And Matthew, if you could close this poll, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Poll is closed now, so you sh if it's still, just X out. Okay. Okay, let's, let's look at the definition of pavement preservation. It is a sum of all activities undertaken to provide and maintain a, service, a serviceable roadway, including preserving the investment, extending the pavement life, enhancing the pavement performance, and assuring cost effectiveness and reduce user delays. This came from Ashto and FHW definition back in the 1990s. An effective pavement preservation program addresses pavements while they're still in good condition and before the onset of serious damage. By applying a cost-effective treatment at the right time, the pavement is restored almost to its original condition. The cumulative effect of schematic success of preservation treatments is to postpone the costly rehabilitation and reconstruction. So what is pavement preservation? It is a proactive approach in maintaining roadways. Pavement preservation addresses pavements whose structural section is still in good condition with significant remaining service life. By applying a cost-effective treatment at the right time, that is before the onset 
of serious damage, the pavement surface can be restored almost to its original condition. So the first step in selecting an appropriate maintenance strategy is to place that pavement in a maintenance category based on the life cycle age and the, pay and the pavement condition index. For a treatment to be considered pavement preservation, one must consider its, its intended purpose. As shown in this table to the far right, the, distinct the distinctive characteristic of pavement preservation activities are that they restore the function of the existing system and extend its service life, not increase its capacity or strength. Some treatments generally used for preventative maintenance are also sometimes used for corrective maintenance. It is therefore important for an owner agency to identify the intended purpose of the treatment it performs. Otherwise, an evaluation of the effectiveness of a pavement preservation program could be biased by treatment performed for a corrective purpose, which may fail earlier than it's performed on a structurally sound pavement. Then our next definition, what is preventative maintenance? It is that planned strategy of cost-effective treatments to an existing roadway system. It's a preventiveness that preserves the system, retards the future deterioration, and maintains or improves the functional condition of the system without significantly increasing the structural capacity. And this comes from the Asheville Standing Committee on Highways. Preventative maintenance is typically applied to a pavement in good condition, having significant remaining service life. As a major component of pavement preservation, Preventative maintenance is a strategy to extend that service life by applying cost-effective treatments to the surface or near the surface or of structurally sound pavements. So we have another polling question. What is an, what is an example of a reactive maintenance activity? So that's the second uh, question there you should see on the bottom of your, on your screen. <clears throat> People want to reply, okay. Ceiling cracks, pothole patching, unplugging drainage facilities, patching or widening of an HAMA pavement. And some more replies here. We'll leave it, leave it open for another 10 seconds. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. And again, this goes back looking at the definition of preservation. Now we want to look at the types of maintenance activities that agencies deal with. Okay, and I'm going to close the poll now and share the results, what we've Great. got. Pothole patching, that is correct, along with uh, unplugging drainage facilities. When we talk about, uh, when we talk about reactive, we'll bring up this next slide here. When we talk about reactive, it's an unscheduled maintenance activity in response to events beyond the control of maintenance organizations, which includes pothole patching, like one of the answers that was there, patching pavement, blow ups, and unplugged drainage facilities. But then let's look at react uh, routine maintenance. That is a scheduled day-to-day -day maintenance activities like sealing cracks. Then we also have corrective. That's a planned activity to repair deficiencies, restore elements of the roadway to its original condition, or increase the service life of a facility, partial depth repairs, a, P a PCC payments, patching or wedging of HMA payments are some examples. And lastly, and what we're here to today to talk about is preventing the maintenance. It's that planned activity intended to preserve the system. So the basics of philosophy behind uh, preventing the maintenance is really keeping good roads in good condition. This definition covers all pavement activities. The real challenge though for many agencies is to identify that right treatment, the right pavement, and the right time. It's more of a challenge because we are trying to do this within a, a framework or to meet a set of objectives that our agencies have.
This figure illustrates the economic concepts of applications of corrective payment treatments. The concept is based on preventative deterioration rates. Accelerated a payment accumulates more damage. To determine if a payment is a good candidate for preventative maintenance, we really need to estimate the payment's remaining life. That is the time of where it starts at the beginning as you see the payment condition curve, as it starts from the beginning and shown in excellence and drastically over a period of time loses its life. And as you can see, at that 75% of that life, it is no longer what we call um, active for preventative maintenance. It gets into that rehab stage. And then as you can see, it drops 40% in quality. Then from that stage on, you can see the, the amount of time frame. it doesn't take very much longer. There's a 40% drop in quality and you have a 12% remaining life. So when we talk about the remaining service life, that is the time from that period of excellent to that period at 75%. And if we can show on, on the curves up above where it shows $2 for a payment preservation here, we can extend that life of that payment. So instead of going from uh, that excellent condition down to the 75% range, we can extend that almost three, uh, three times as much as we can with these preventative maintenance to extend that payment life. Agencies need to recognize the benefits of implementing preventative maintenance. What is common to agencies that have successful preventative maintenance programs is that the agency has objectives system-wide that they feel they, cannot, they can meet using the conventional tools and approaches that have been used in the past. We took a poll back in 2001 and uh, we interviewed Michigan DOT and they claimed that they have been able to balance the performance of their network through the use of preventative maintenance. Are there, are there other benefits uh, that include, that are shown here below? Smoother roads, fewer construction lanes. Oftentimes many agencies have concerns about noise and that's another effective uh, benefit that agencies can have. Extending the service to the traveling public is something that we also wanna keep in mind because the greater customer satisfaction doesn't get, uh, doesn't get pronounced enough. Uh, we wanna know what the public's views of our roads are and our agencies organized to address the public use as it currently is today. So let's look at the meeting agency's objectives. As we stated before, agencies that have an active program in preventive maintenance have realized the benefits after a relative short period of time. Michigan DOT reported that they had saved 700 million in saving to keep the same level of service over five years from September 2000 poll. In addition, they develop objectives versus meeting those objectives. They create their goals. And also they are, are they being met? They need to track them over a period of time and then address any challenges that they may have to implementing their programs. Having a strong preservation program is founded on these key components listed on the slide. If these components are not in place, your preservation program may not be achieving all the benefit benefits. Quality data, decision-making framework, preservation culture, treatment availability, and contractor availability. So next we're gonna dive into key topics of discussion, payment condition versus property collection. We need to know what our payment condition is before we can come out there and put any kind of preservation treatment on our particular roadway. The role of pavement surface. A pavement surface serves four roles. Provide smooth pavements, skid resistant riding surface, keeping moisture out of our sublayer, and load distribution. Next, we have another polling question. What does smooth ride mean to you? Okay, so we're gonna ask people to use the chat box to reply to this one. The chat box is on the bottom of your toolbar, should be in the middle, it says chat. Um, if you wanna put in your answer to what does a smooth ride mean to you? 
and you can uh, post that to everybody and uh, we'll see what, we've got some different opinions there about what does it mean to you? Smooth ride. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, we've got free of potholes and imperfections in the pavement surface. Anybody else? Don't be shy. Okay, here they come. <laughs> you seeing them coming in, Jason? Yes, I sure do. Okay, there you go. I'll let you take over. I just need to bring them up so I can see them. Comfortable, safe drive. Excellent. A well-maintained road, happy driver. Exactly. Easy on off roads. Uh, no complaints. We don't get enough of those, do we? Free of large vehicle deflections. Exactly. Smooth to the, uh, the, uh, to the driver. Excellent. Thanks for taking the time to do this. A pavement's ride is affected by roughness caused by distress. Built in unevenness and unevenness, une unevenness that develops over time. It is discussed in a greater detail as we go through here through the next few slides. So now let's talk about two measures of pavement performance. We looked at the factors that affect pavement performance and how, how were they considered and how they are measured in reporting performance. We use these two measures indicated here functional performance, as well as structural performance. A pavement may be extremely smooth today, but is grossly deficient structurally, it will not last very long. Similarly, a pavement may be more than adequately structurally, but poor functioning performance in later years. And here, as you can see in functional performance, that is the ride, the smoothness of one observes as riding down a roadway and also as friction numbers and skid numbers. And then structural performance is where we come in with our FWD and measure the deflection of our pavement surface and have an understanding of what our pavement is below the top of the surface. So the attributes of pavement in good condition. From this perspective to the traveling public, they, have, they enjoy the good rideability. Uh, they also have, they want the good surface friction. When it's rainy, uh, things like that, they want to be able to stop at a period of time, not, not causing accidents, which leads right into the next question, is safety. We also want to correct that edge drop off and the rutting aspects. And then lastly, extending that target performance indicator as limited deterioration will have if we maintain our pavements in good condition. Varying guidance is available on acceptable IRI and PCR about levels. Factors in considering include ADT, speed limits, functional classification, HC, and so on. One scheme taken from the Pennsylvania Department um, shows that for their IRIs, for very good conditions, they use a factor of 60 and below. For good, 60 to 94. For fair, 95 to 119. So these rating systems can be used to help agencies uh, use for measuring their performance. And again, here are some common factors for IRI, less than 95 inches per mile. That's what, that's what we wanna use our pavement preservations to, to include up to this limit of 95. And then it gets a little bit skeptical as we move up in that 95 inches per mile. In addition, the PCI levels, we wanna have 70 or above for PCRs, whatever your agency use for an indicator um, greater than 3.5. And then for your skid numbers, we wanna make sure that we're greater than 35. So in determining if a project is a good candidate for preventative maintenance, what we need to talk about is the no structural failures. Again, as we mentioned earlier, we wanna make sure the pavement is structurally sound. There is no bottom up cracking um, that's causing fatigue in the wheel pass and et cetera. So we wanna make sure it's structurally sound. In addition, we wanna make sure there's minimal distress. Extent and severity are very important. And lastly, we wanna make sure the pavements are relative young in age. Because if we have a pavement that's been out there the 15 to 20 years, it may be beyond that pavement preservation um, approach. So 
one thing to consider. Also, few historical problems with similar projects, meaning that um, in that particular area, if you had something similar occur, it may not be something that uh, from your, your, your point of view, may be not be appropriate for pavement preservation. And lastly, we need to estimate that pavement condition and future performance. And how do we go about doing that? That goes on to directly to the next slides. What pavement characteristics indicate pavement condition? First, let's define what we mean when we say pavement condition. Typically, a discussion of pavement condition is thought of what you can see on the pavement surface. But as we have indicated, what you don't see can be more or as important in determining where a pavement is on its deterioration curve. A visible performance indicators are shown as functional indicators and structural indicators. For functional performance, it is at ride and at safety. The aspects of the ride quality include smoothness and noise. Safety includes friction and removal of standing water. For structural performance, it refers to that low carrying ability of that pavement. We can look at indirectly by measuring the pavement's response to the loads as testing the overall strength of the pavement or the strength of individual layers. And lastly, we talk about the non-visible effects. That is the environmental effects of the materials and that load related damage. And we'll talk about that as we further go on this presentation. Next, let's look at the estimated future performance. When we talk about estimating perform pavement performance, well, we really are interested in determining where the pavement is on its expected pavement preservation curve as shown here. In general, the pavement deteriorates functionally and structurally along the same, the, same, the same type of curve, which starts at good condition and ends up in poor condition over time. Here we show in good performance, here's that preventative maintenance window of opportunity where we need to go in and put our uh, pavement preservation treatment. And then showing the pavement condition curves, uh, conditions on the far left-hand side. How do you determine a pavement's true condition? Well, one looks first want to look at conducting surveys, looking at the type and the amount of severity of the stresses, uh, deficiencies on that particular roadway. There are a lot of other types of distresses that could be visible on a pavement. Examples include material-related problems, reactive aggregate or deep cracking, uh, bleeding on the, bleeding in the asphalt itself, subgrade softening, and traffic-related surface problems, what's also referred to as polishing. Do these other visible distresses help determine whether or not a pavement is a good candidate for preventative maintenance? And yes, they do. The type and the amount of severity of distresses and deficiencies will typically give indications of the underlying problem. Identifying these deficiencies will help exclude pavements from consideration for preventative maintenance. Additional information, historical records are also key in looking at a preservation candidates. And then using engineering judgment as a last result to, to feel where everybody feels comfortable about a particular type of treatment. What are some other types of techniques that are used for pavement condition? With these performance indicators in mind, uh, we look at field surveys that can be used to access these performance conditions. Contrast project level and network levels. In pavement management, there are project level surveys done when the network level survey has triggered potential projects. All of these surveys types give useful information when deciding on whether or not to apply preventative maintenance, as well as selecting the appropriate pavement preservation technique. Visual distress surveys give an indication of current functional and structural condition. The roughness and friction surveys are a functional related. The drainage evaluation can be helpful in preventing structural problems. And lastly, deflection testing can be used to provide information regarding the structural condition at specific points of the pavement surface itself. And here's a slide showing basically Oops. 
slide just kind of went away, uh, showing the various methods that can be used, inspect and visually, uh, detailed measurements, automated distresses, and et cetera. There it is. Now we're back on key here. And again, here is the, uh, the differences between automated versus uh, using vehicles to measure distress, uh, distress identification. Now let's talk about interpreting the survey results. This slide summarizes the role that surveys play in determining appropriate preventative maintenance. Surveys actually tell what the payment can be excluded from payment preventative maintenance consideration. If visible, the stresses are observed and the surveys can tell the preventative to still appropriate and then help determine the underlying causes of the, of the visible uh, distress. So next, we'll look at the field site reviews to identify the stresses. Types and severity of the stresses in the surface layers and the integrity of the pavement structure determine whether a road requires reconstruction, resurfacing, or maintenance. The failure observed can be structural or, or surface. Structural failures can result from poor design, excess traffic volumes or weights, poor drainage, poor materials, or poor construction. Structural failures may also be associated with poor bonding between the surface layers and the pavement, leading to slippage cracking. Next, I'd like to talk about the catalyst of deterioration. And then what we talked about first is, is causes of distress. Uh, they're either in one of these four uh, uh, attributes, either traffic related, environmental aging, material problems, or water infiltration. Let's first look at rutting. Here again, the amount of traffic that's on a particular roadway, uh, load related distresses are usually rutting, fatigue cracking, polishing and surface deformation. When it comes to the environmental aging distresses, uh, the characteristics are raveling and weathering as shown in that upper right-hand corner, the block cracking on the bottom left and thermal cracking on the bottom right. Next, the materials related distresses can result uh, into bleeding or flushing that is shown on the bottom left-hand side, the slippage cracking uh, or delamination on the upper, upper right, and thermal segregation as shown on the bottom right of your pavement during construction. Next, let's look at water infiltration. That is your edge cracking as shown on the upper right, laying the shoulder drop off right down below that, loss of fines and materials or what we call referred to as pumping on the bottom left, and then potholes as we all are familiar with on the bottom right. A number of distresses may occur in the asphalt surface layer of a pavement, uh, pavement structure. These distresses can be broadly categorized as cracking, deformation, deterioration, and map problems. Cr cracking can occur as a result of traffic loading and thermal stresses caused by low temperatures or oxidation at the surface. Oxidation increases the stiffness of the asphalt, making it more brittle or hard and causing premature cracking. Deformation or rutting or shoving in the asphalt pavement layer is often caused by traffic loading at the elevated temperature. Rutting can occur in large areas. Deterioration of the surface raveling or stripping is caused by a variety of factors, such as problems with the HMA materials, mix design problems, environmental conditions, and traffic loading. And lastly, finally, the problems in the mat, segregation and bleeding are associated with the mix design are in proper construction techniques. And hopefully um, when that time comes, when you out there looking at your distresses, you can look at this table and I'll help you identify what are some of the common factors. So next look at the types of functional distresses that can be treated by preservation. And they are included here, the block cracking, the longitudinal cracking, et cetera, transverse, reflective, potholes, flush and bleeding, raveling, weathering, pumping and water bleeding, the polished aggregates. These are the types of functional distresses. The types of structural distresses that can be treated with local repairs include fatigue, cracking, edge cracking, 
unstable rutting, shoving, and patch deterioration. These are for HMA. And the next ones we're gonna talk about is for concrete. The types of functional distresses that can be treated by preservation include longitudinal cracking, transverse, minor faulting, patching deterioration, pop-outs, pumping and water bleeding, and so forth. The types of structural distresses that can, can be treated with local repairs include corner breaks and mid-panel cracking. With that said, most agencies have a distress identification manual that they use to identify their raters that go out and rate the roads. And if often agencies don't have some, um, often it's referred to as the FHWA distress identification manual can be used as agencies are moving in that di direction to help with the understanding the cracking that's occurring on their roadways. Moving on, additional information needed. The design and construction records are important. Some of the additional data needs, needs which can be obtained from existing design and construction records. When combining with com uh, compiled data from the distress survey, this information provides a sound basis for selection of an appropriate preventative maintenance treatment. But some additional information, if possible, it is also useful to work directly with the field and construction and maintenance staff and other preventive maintenance personnel to develop a sense of the maintenance history of various projects and treatments have performed in the best. Again, this information should be completed uh, with the data distress surveys to help provide for a better preventative maintenance treatment selection. Reviewing the pavement management system or planning data can help identify the most appropriate effective schedule of the appropriate preventative maintenance. So the question is, how is preventive maintenance used to preserve the investment? Well, based on all the types of preventive maintenance techniques that have been presented, uh, these are the types of things that we'll be discussing per, per, by preserving our investment, keeping the water out, reducing that infiltration, maintaining that drainage is key. Drainage, drainage, drainage is often referred to by many, the three Ds. Reduce the debris infiltration into the cracks. Slow that aging effects of that bituminous pavement. And then minimizing that dynamic loads is very important. The rougher the pavement surface, the higher the impact of that dynamic loads will contribute. When should a preventive maintenance be applied? This concept of preventive maintenance deterioration and performance it's easy to superimpose the regions of the deterioration curve where the different categories of maintenance, preventive maintenance is versus where there are deferred actions or where the agencies may take based on funding eligibility and funding constraints. And then the rehabilitation aspects come in mind. As indicated, preventive maintenance is an activity that is exercised early in the payment live when the overall condition of payment is really relatively high level. Given this, it should be clear that the distress surveys required for a preventive maintenance program must take place early in the payment life. For example, three to six years for flexible payments and four to eight years for rigid payments. It is important to learn from your payments at these ranges will differ for each group of the payment with similar characteristics. In addition, to determining the appropriate timing for the preventative maintenance application, one also must determine the most appropriate frequency for that additional application. And lastly, reconstruction. So which should preventative maintenance be applied as shown in the uh, curve early on when payment is in good condition? You can, you can continue to maintain that high level of service with the repeated applications in relative inexpensive preventative maintenance treatments for your particular agency, as shown there in the red. So when is it too late for preventative maintenance? Well, when we're dealing with HMA payments, uh, when there are signs of potholes, as well as severe deteriorated cracks, delamination, unstable rutting, 
and others. For PCC payments, blow-ups, corner breaks, severe deterioration cracks, and others. These next uh, two tables I like to share for those uh, are the maximum allowable distresses for HMA. This bar, chart, this bar chart shows general guidance for the maximum state of distress uh, in terms of extended severity that is allowable in flexible payments if it is considered a candidate for preventive maintenance. The term extent is meant to incorporate both the severity and the amount. And as you can see, for friction loss, is shown in green, comes in really high, as well as roughness, flushing, bleeding, raveling, and etc. Next, for the maximum allowable distresses for PCC, again, friction loss comes in very high, as well as linear cracking, joint spalling, decracking, and surface distress. So hopefully you can find that these tables can be helpful. So the biggest challenge is that condition, that timing, that maximum effectiveness. Is it too early to put up preservation treatment on it? For agencies like Montana, and there are a few others, they put, they put on their preventative and maintenance treatment right after, uh, right after they overlay their particular roadway. And through their studies, it's found to be effective. And that's the best time for them to put on their, their what they call their chip seal over their uh, brand new HMA. However, then we got the picture in the middle. That's a little too late. As you can see, the crackings are getting, the, 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 uh, the stress, the severity is getting much higher. Um, we're talking about two to four or five inches of those cracks, widths. And then on the far to the right is the right time, where there's very little amount of distress. So the treatment options versus conditions as shown here on the treatment condition curve, we often start with fog seal, rejuvenators, down to slurry seals, chip seals, cape seals, HMA overlays. And then we're getting down to the lower aspects, the mill and, the mill and HMA overlays, which is common practice for most, most agencies on the East Coast there. I worked in the Sterling, Virginia office uh, for our Eastern Federal Lands office. And for the, last, for the five, six years that I was there, this was a common practice for most of our, our parks in that particular area then the in-place recycling, and then the full depth reconstruction. So if we can start on off at the early stages of put, putting some kind of chip seal or a micro serving or a cape seal in which will be discussed later by Sam and Chuck, these are the addable times of where we need to reach for to put these preservation treatments on. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about how do you define quality? And we got our last polling question here. How do you define quality? And Matthew, if you can bring up this poll, I'd appreciate it. Okay, just a second. This one, um, I think that this one's gonna be a uh, chat box reply as well. So reply, reply in your chat box what your definition of quality is. Jason, this is Matt. While uh, uh, just while people were putting that in the chat box, I just want to give you a heads up that we're probably about nine minutes out. So, uh, and we've got uh, one or two questions in the chat box that we'd like to get your thoughts on. You bet. And I know Chuck Ingram is going to talk about quality construction and practices here later, but I want to get everybody on board of what quality means to you. This is important. Okay, we just got some replies coming in the chat box. Okay. All right, let's look at some of the responses here. Thanks for smooth and long lasting roadways. Good. Achievement of expected performance. 
smooth and long lasting, finish, durability and quality, durability and efficiency, very good. I'll play an important role, but oftentimes quality is often defined as a conforming to our specifications, correct? Part of the quality definition refers to compliance with specifications. What type of specifications that your agencies are using are ideal. So we have this uh, diagram here showing specifications to implement quality. And over the years, as we can see on the far left-hand side, many agencies had method specifications. And then over the years, we have kind of gone to more into end result specifications, to more performance related specifications. And then to the far right hand side is where we're seeing across maybe parts of the country are those warranties and maintenance agreements. These are the perspectives of what specifications influence quality. And I'm sure for most of you guys is we're probably in that range of, of perspective of somewhere in between method specification and end result specifications for most of our our local agencies types of specifications. Agencies qualification programs usually document the responsibilities assigned to each one of these projects and that's what needs to be included in their specifications. Moving on. What is your role in promoting quality? Well, here, the engineer and the inspector play an important part in ensuring the quality of an asphalt pavement construction project for the agencies. They're supporting the project manager and the other agency staff. As you can see here for the inspector, they inspect that thickness. They want to document uh, what kind of conditions they are seeing out there. And then they want to communicate that back to the RE. Inspect the quality of the construction and be the eyes and ears of the project manager, verifying the contractor is following the acceptable paving plan for the scope, paving thickness, density, and joint location are all important keys that one has to, has to keep in mind. Some common agencies responsibilities for the agencies to inspect, look at the layout, the equipment, and the quality that's being performed. When it comes to the documentation, looking at the instructions, the specifications, the quantities, and the locations placed in the design plans. And then when it comes to communicating, look at the safety considerations and the issues that may affect the quality over a period of time. Next, I'd like to end up with the quality assurance programs with preservation treatments. They're no different than reconstruction or rehabilitation there are measures that agencies have to have that they have to have the quality assurance program set up to look at uh, making sure that they have the proper acceptance testing, the independence assurance, having some kind of dispute resolution aspects, and then making sure that the personnel and the accreditation of the certifications are being done. And lastly, the laboratory accreditation and certifications. Next and the last topic is looking at the resources. I want to share with you some of the things that we've done in the past few years through everyday accounts and et cetera. Um, there are free web-based trainings that are available out there. Um, there's the website where you can go to for chip seals, microsurfacing, and slurry seal boxes. We're in the process early on developing a continuation of this uh, and updated of this uh, web-based training looking at combination treatments. So stay tuned, probably in the next less than a year or so, we'll have that available. That's on the asphalt side. On the concrete side, we have an NHI course, 134207 on construction quality of PCC pavements. And you can go to this site and you can see the difference, the, four, the five different types of uh, pavement preservation treatments that one can look at. Each, each one of these are about an hour long and they contain, they contain about five different uh, levels of looking at, a, like let's say partial depth repatching. They first give an introduction and then go into more of what are things that need to be defined and et cetera. So you get a chance, these are free by the way, for through NHI. So if you get a chance, we just got done completing these. And in addition, they are also available in Spanish 
um, to help those in incline. Moving on and working with the PP, PPRA, Pavement Preservation and Recycling Alliance, as of last February, we have developed some online or, or some uh, virtual training classes every month. And here shows some upcoming webinars on November and December on micro and slurry mix designs and in December full depth recycling. On the far, hand, far bottom right hand side, there are some recorded webinars that one can go to at their discretion at their time. And basically uh, click in one of those websites, it'll take you to a, a video recording showing up that webinar. Hey, Jason. In addition, uh, there's some helpful links, FHWA checklists and tech briefs, Ashto, Sharp, R26, high traffic volume roadways, as well as our federal aid essential videos for flexible and regional payments. And then lastly, Payment Preservation and Recycling Alliance website. Jason, uh, you know, can we, uh, these are, these are going to be available in the handout as clickable uh, things. Do you, can we just take a minute uh, as you wrap up to uh, hit on a, a question or two in the chat box? We just got a minute or so left. Yeah, I just want to show these last this last slide, and that runs right into our question and answer. All right. So uh, uh, one one question that came in early on is uh, is an interesting one. Uh, how do you consolidate conditions and propose maintenance or rehab? For large road networks, uh, and what if any software do you use to accomplish the planned work, prioritization, costing? Excellent question. Um, you know, it, it's something that it happens over a period of time. It's not something that happens overnight. And I really like the this second bullet here, uh, implementing a PMS for local agencies. It's a great document that kind of goes in in some of those aspects, as well as the one selecting a preventive maintenance treatment for flexible pavements, both offer some ideas and some strategies and also some um, software that's available for agencies that can use. And, and when it comes to software, that second bullet is a great site. There's a table at the near the end that shows some of the software that can be used to help local agencies just get started with this program. And then there's some others that for agencies that have a program, how to further advance their systems. So I hope that helps. It does. And just uh, one, one close out with one quick comment we got in the chat box that I thought was interesting uh, is it said that it'd be really helpful to tie the, you know, the uh, treatment versus condition uh, sort of chart there. Uh, if it would be, if you could tie that to PCI or IRI, IRI numbers uh, just as a, uh, something to think about uh, for the future in terms of presenting it that way. Um, Good point. So we're, we're, uh, we're at our time limit or just a minute over. Thanks everybody for hanging into us. That's a lot of content in, in, a, in a short period of time. Jason, thanks so much for uh, presenting that to us and, and sharing that with us today. And uh, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Matthew Bradley to tell us where to go next. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jason and Matt, uh, for our attendees are wrapping up this session. So if you could, uh, in the lower right hand corner, you should see a leave button in red uh, that will leave this classroom and then you will go back to the platform where you have a choice between uh, 2A and 2B. Uh, 2A is safety and traffic control for limited work, uh, limited space work zones. And session 2B is managing your response to conflict. Those sessions will start at 10 o'clock sharp. You've got about eight minutes to take a bio break or get another cup of coffee. And we will see you there and to our speaker and moderator. See you soon. Everybody.